Hello, I'm Brian Kirby, host of 502 Conversations. The following conversation was recorded at SciCon 2019. SciCon is the annual Committee for Skeptical Inquiry Conference, a four-day event sponsored by the Center for Inquiry, where people from all over the world gather to attend workshops and talks given by scientists, critical thinkers, doctors, investigative journalists, philosophers, and others, all promoting reason and science and fighting against pseudoscience in all of its forms, including medical quackery, psychics, conspiracy theories, superstition, and magical thinking. Speakers have included Brian Greene, Julia Sweeney, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Fry, Paul Offit, Elizabeth Loftus, Kurt Anderson, Michael Mann, and many, many more. The Center for Inquiry encourages scientific inquiry, critical investigation, and the use of reason, and they publish Skeptical Inquirer, the magazine for science and reason. You can learn more at centerforinquiry.org. Coming up, my conversation with science activist and former world's greatest psychic, Mark Edward. Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is the esteemed Mark Edward. Thank you. How's it going, Brian? Well, it's going fairly well. Good. And I have your bio here, which I'm going to read. Okay. It's much, this is Mark's second appearance on 502 Conversations because we didn't get to some things last time, and he so kindly agreed to come back. So obviously he's forgotten everything that happened last time. Or, Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> or he wouldn't have come back. So let me read your bio because it's important, actually. Okay. Mark Edward is famous Psychic Friends Network superstar, psychic to the rich and famous, seancer, author, numerous TV appearances on shows such as A&E's Biography, NBC's The Other Side, The Learning Channel's Exploring the Universe, and Penn and & Teller's Bullshit. Mark is an investigator for the truth and scammer of the scammers, because above all, Mark Edward is an expert cold reader and performer. Correct? Correct. All, right. all, all true. And performer, I think, is a key part of our conversation today. Yes. So last time we talked a lot about your, um, your experiences as an undercover psychic for your book, Psychic Blues, Confessions of a Conflicted Medium. Correct. And we didn't quite get into too much of the skepticism, so that's, that's mm -hmm. what I want to focus on today. But I've got to start with some of the background from uh, the conflicted medium part, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, because you did get some... Do you mind... If, if, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I want right. to have an honest conversation. Yeah. And so sometimes you may speak, and I'll interrupt if I don't understand something, because I'm sure if I don't understand it, maybe, well, no, I could be the only one, I suppose. <laughs> but, but, but I'll need it explained to me, so we okay. can go on. All right. um, it's, but what I mean by not offending you is I'm just asking questions here. And one of the things is that I noticed for some bizarre reason you got some, I don't know if it's pushback about the book mm -hmm. from people, magicians, other mentalists. I'm not sure exactly who, and I'm not quite sure what the motivation was. Right. So I don't know if we'll touch upon that at all, but if it comes up incidentally, it just comes up. Sure. Because you it was kind I, of surprising to me. I didn't I'm not offended because I, I didn't write the book to just be a, have a tepid response. Oh, okay. Well, wow, that's know. an honest answer right I'm there. I'm trying to, you know, offend as many people as possible to get them to read the book. Oh, good. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old sideshow trick, you know? I mean, you draw Part in. of the performance. Well, I think it is. I, in writing the book, I did not want to lose any market. The book was not written for skeptics alone. I wanted to try and, my, my whole goal in writing it was to be a book that people would see in the Hudson newsstand uh, at the airport on their way to take a flight and buy it and read it on the airplane. So, you know, when you think about controversy, there are two sides of the story. So I wanted to try and tell both and, and make, widen the market, you know, because skeptical books are, are debunking books, which I hate that term. That's all they are. And people who might have just the slightest belief or want to know more about it, you're not really talking to them. So it was impossible to please everybody. I had just 
please myself. So so what was, I guess we're right into it, so I might as well just go with that. So what was the objection that you thought? Because I'm not... Because I, I portrayed the role of a psychic, and I, and I took, took money for being... Re honestly? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, you honestly portrayed your experience. No, what I did is I became... The only way you can really learn... It's like carnival things. The only way you can really learn the art of the psychic marketplace is you have to put yourself in the middle of it and play that role. Because psychics, you can't go to a psychic and go, how'd you do that one thing? Because they're, they're more secretive than magicians. They have their techniques, but they want to keep them on the lowdown. So the only way you can really get to the core of the matter is to play the game. So my whole goal was, I am going to scam these scammers. I'm going to be wink, wink, nod, nod with them and, and navigate my way to the top of as high as I could go with that. Well, let me pull something, and you can explain this to me. Do you mind? I'll, I'll pull a quote, or just so you can tell me what you're... From who? I think it's from you. Okay. And my, so my question is, what is psychic phenomenon? Right. And I think from you said it happens, or it does occur from time to time with all of us, but when someone says they can make it happen on a consistent basis, right. I don't buy it. Right. And so you also say it's entertainment, a con, and you're not a real psychic. Right. So can you define what psychic phenomenon is, the one that happens to us all from time to time? Because that's what I, yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the things that all psychics take advantage of when they try and convince you they're real. Oh, uh, something you ever, like, you're thinking about somebody and you pick up the phone and there they are, you know? Right, or so that's not a psychic phenomenon. Is, did you find a penny somewhere? Because he wants you to acknowledge that he's there and that that penny was for you and it came from him. Or did the lights go off in the room? Do they come sometimes turn off and on? That's him. So is that, that is psychic phenomenon, and that's what they're saying. They're calling, they're using those kind of just happenstance well, things and so, saying that they're societal in nature. Meaning, depending on which part of the world, there's different techniques of that. But when I say psychic phenomenon, I'm talking about the more recognized things where people have a uh, uh, an experience that they can't explain. Because I mean, psychic phenomenon, we don't really know what it is or why it happens, but. If you ask most, peop most people, have you ever had something uh, paranormal happen to you, they will say yes. But then they're defining paranormal as just something I can't explain. It. That is correct. What you've described, though, isn't paranormal. It's normal. Yes. It happens all the time. Yes. So why would somebody say that's a paranormal experience? Because they don't understand science. And that's the job that I do is I try to investigate it by listening more than anything. And and just offer my possibilities to people who bring these things forward. And depending on their mental state, they could be totally whacked out. So, and I can tell that pretty quickly too. That's part of being a reader. So you, you know, you're, you're navigating an area of the human mind that is, there's all sorts of boulders and rocks in, 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 in the way of clear thinking. So all I can really do is interpret based on my own personal experience. So I have had the same sort of discussion with people, yeah. and they will go, oh, um, okay, so you explain that, but tell me, you can't explain this thing. Right. I said, well, you know, it's I'm just the conversation's kind of over at that point. Right. But they don't want to hear that if they find a penny on the street, their grandfather didn't leave it for them at that point. They don't want to hear it? Right. Or they, they do want to hear They don't want to hear that it's just something that happens to all of us. It's not, you know, right. when you pick up the phone and it's your friend you were just thinking of, that happens to everybody once a year or so. That doesn't make it... Right. A paranormal thing, but some people want to... That's right. That's the people who go to see psychics who want to reach a dead, a deceased relative or a murdered child, they're a totally different mindset from the person that you're talking about. They want to find that penny in the street. They want to find, they want to see the lights go on and off because to them, it, it gives them comfort that their dead loved one is there. That is paranormal. Uh, we're, wow, we're into mediums already. I can't believe this. No, I mean, they're, they're all, they're all the part of the same I ball see. of wax. They're all part of the manipulation of people's emotions. That's what, that's what mediums do, and that's what world leaders do, you okay. know? <laughs> yeah, manipulate the masses. I got it. So in our previous conversation, and I'm going to read this because I have it. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you liked performing. You like talking to people, and you liked making them happy with your opinion, reading poems, tarot, 
the occult, but you never liked any of the mumbo jumbo, such as misleading people into the supernatural. So everything you did or you do, it's all by natural means, right? Yeah, as far as I know. But again, some people say, oh, poor Mark, you know. He's really psychic, but he just doesn't want to admit to it. Oh, wow. I've had that happen a lot. Okay. Like the experience that happened today. I will explain it. Okay, so today... But we'll get to that later, oh, unless right. you want to jump right to it right now. Well, no, well, let's wait a minute on that. Let me look okay. at one other thing. Myself, looking at it as a skeptic, I guess, and I want to understand what's happening. Doesn't the mumbo-jumbo kind of have to be there? No. Because, well, let me explain. When I show up to see Mark Edward... Yeah. I, I expect a certain uh, a certain presence that you're going to project. Like, you've got the black hat, you've got your good luck charm. Right. You don't do a thing with a crystal ball, I assume. Um, oh, yeah, I've done that. Okay, and, or when you do a seance, there are props that yeah, you use. Yeah, of course. So when you, it's not like here, you know, when you come in, you see mics that hopefully work all the time. Yeah. Two lights, three cameras. It sets up your expectation for the experience. Right. Um, and when I flew here, you know, you get on the plane, the pilot's wearing a suit and tie. He doesn't need that. Right. He could be in sweatpants and a sweatshirt, but I'd right. be uncomfortable with that. It would not That's be. right. So doesn't the mumbo-jumbo have to be there? Do you understand where yes, I'm coming from? Yes, no, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from, and I agree with you because, uh, but I am a, I'm a, in, in the more of a reductionist mode. Less is more. That's the way I look at it. Uh, my mentor when I was in art school at Cal Arts was John Baldessari, who was a conceptual artist. And when I studied under him, he would always say, keep paring it down, keep taking away the crystal ball till all that's left is you. You are what you're selling. You, you the performance artist, is what the product is. So that has spilled over into my performance career ever since. So depending on the venue, like if somebody calls me up and they say, we need a gypsy for this party, can you bring your crystal ball? Yes, and if you read my book, there's a thing the guy says, hey, Mark, we need some voodoo shit, you know? Have you got like a skull or something you can bring? And I'm like, no problem, Dino, I'll bring the skull, you know? And so I bring a skull. So depending on the venue, yes, you, you, tease, the, you tease the sitter into buying into it. But the core of real mentalism is to have nothing and just walk into a room and have people go, whoa, there's that guy that can do these crazy things. And that's always been my goal. It's called barehanded bookings. So both can be done, and there's a whole spectrum in between. You know, you can clutter your whole table with angels and candles and all that stuff, but it depends. It's, it, there's, no, there's no set thing. And that's part of the fun of it, is finding a situation where you can express yourself in the clearest possible way. So to really answer your question, when I do tarot or palms or crystal readings, which I really don't do that much anymore. I understand. Yeah. But when I did, I always let the spectator know in, in no uncertain terms that this was bullshit. So you did. Okay. Yeah. So it's a... It's, it's a party thing, you yeah. know, as, as it was in the book. It, it, I was never trying to get a hook in somebody to, you know, uh, get into their life savings or anything like that. So you've, now that we're having this conversation, it's, it reminds me of even more stuff. So when, if you go to a restaurant and they have their three-star reviews on the wall, if you yeah. go to a mechanic, he's got his Better Business Bureau, right. or I've been trained by this, yeah. that's all playing into the expectation. Oh, you absolutely. So you see that probably differently than most people. You see that all over the place now. Yeah. Not you, but, I mean, you probably do, actually. No, I do. So people I'm... are trying to, I guess the term would be bullshit everybody all the time. Well, it, it, it depends on whether you want to stay in character all the time, and that's difficult. But I have, uh, I have a degree from the School of Mediumship, and it's on parchment, and it's framed. looks really good. Are the but edges it's... burned? No, <laughs> because, because I wanted to look like a real certificate, and it is. I mean, it's printed by a company that prints any anything you want on it. You know, like you can be a goddess, you can be. Uh, oh wow! And you, you have know. one of those on your wall? Not anymore, oh, but okay. I but I carried it with me in my bag. So if people ever questioned me, I'd say, "Look, here's my mediumship degree from the Lear uh, Learning Light Foundation or wherever I got it from." But again, people are paying me to play a character. They're not paying me to say, you know, I'm a skeptic, and, you know. I think, okay, so I think now that that refreshes my memory, that's kind of where the objection came in, because... Too bad. Okay, so let me finish it, though. So they, they were, you were being paid to be 
the, to play the psychic. Yes. And I guess the objection was um, that I took money you, from no, people, or was it that you couldn't, you didn't convince people hard enough that you were no, playing a no, part? No, I don't what know what it was. It was. There were a very few people out there, and I'm not going to mention names. You don't have to. It just I've... didn't like me. Oh, okay. Well, that's different then. And so when they saw the situation where, I, and I couldn't really please anybody because. When I was doing the psychic research, which is what I was doing yeah, yeah. for many years, playing the role of a psychic, the magicians hated it. Did you read my book? I did, yeah. So, I mean, the magicians were like, how could you do that? You're a magician. You're, you shouldn't be doing that. That's wrong, you know? And I'd be like, look, you can tell me that after the book is written, you know? And we'll see what you think. Then on the other hand, when I uh, exposed all the psychics in my book that I had worked with, then they're mad about that. They're like, you gave away some of our secrets. You gave away some of our tricks and oh. how we do things. You're no good, you know? So I couldn't win. But the bottom line is, it's a free country. I make my decisions and I move forward. And if you don't like it, don't read the book. Yeah, yeah. If you don't like me, that's another issue. But, it, and really, I think it was a personal thing more than anything. Certain magicians and the ones that I, I have to mention when I really got the most back blowback from this were in Europe and they were magicians who had these groups that were using mentalism to convince people that they were real. I wasn't on that train for very long because once I realized how seriously they were they were duping people with magic and mentalism then I distanced myself from them and when the book came out or when I started doing some of the TV shows, they, they said they banned me from England, from ever lecturing in England again. And I found out later, the Magic Circle doesn't ban people. It was just this little group of people who felt very threatened that I was saying that what they're doing is tricks, you know. So it, they were mixing folk magic and cunning man stuff, and it's very convincing. But the bottom line is they were out to dupe people and tell them they were real. And you said you uh, you you uh, mentioned earlier that poor Mark is psychic, but he doesn't know it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard that a lot. Well, let me ask a specific question about that because you did say that I think this is you. Psychic is like art; it's a form of performance, and it's whatever you can get away with. Yeah. Okay. Art is anything you can get away with. Magic is anything you can get away with. So what I'm hearing from you is there are a lot of people getting away with a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's trickery, but they're trying, a lot of them pass it off as it's real. They're not, oh, yeah. it's not like going to a magic show where you know it's a trick, but no. you don't know it. So they're not really trying. No. So even though you say I'm a performer, I'm an artist, or Randy has said it, Ray Hyman has vouched yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. And this is what I've heard from other people. Even though you may say, you know, I'm not. This is I'm an artist. This I just have this ability to cold read or whatever you would call it I, to do palm readings. And you think it's real because it's coming. It's, it's connecting with you, but yeah. it's not real. Right. Does that in any way give cover to the people that say it's real? Because they can I don't care. Okay. Because this stuff's been around for thousands of years. It's not going to be on my back whether they believe it or not. <laughs> That's a good I'm just. I am just. I am just trying to tell the truth the way I see it, you know? And if, they, if they're smart and they're interested and they're educated, they will see that it is an artifice. And that's why I tell people, I'm intensely interested in the artifice of clairvoyance and mind reading and, and not, not the scientific dictionary uh, definition of it, but the mythology behind it and why people want to believe it. That's all I really care about. I'm not trying to make money or trick anybody. If I wanted to do that, I would have yeah. done that. And you, you have know? the skill to do it. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> I could have turned that corner, you know, and I could have said, okay, I'm going to really start making some money. But as a magician, I knew it was wrong. So I had a conscience and I said, just write the book and take whatever comes from that and, and then move on with your life and be a science activist. So that's what I look at myself as now. Science activism, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, well, let's get into the skeptic part that we didn't in, get into last time because the entire time you're working on this book and your, your roots in skepticism are very deep mm -hmm. and they're lifelong, or not lifelong. Or, but Yeah, they're lifelong. So um, we never got to that somehow because the, we just didn't get to it. So as a science activist, 
we're at SciCon 2019, you've done TAM, you do workshops around the world. But what were you doing today? So you went to an elementary school or a school? What happened yeah, today? Yeah, Susan Gerbic and I uh, <clears throat> proposed this program to bring, there's a science school in Las Vegas, and they're teenagers. And some of them are really gifted. And Susan proposed this idea to bring them to SciCon, pay scholarships so that they could be here, and they'll be here on Friday. But we also told them that we'd be happy to come out to the school and do some little demonstrations of what the kind of things that we were going to be talking about. So uh, my thing was to do some demonstrations of magic. And of course, they loved it. But one of those things happened which, where everything kind of jumped out of the frame, <laughs> which is what I really do this stuff for. I do this stuff <clears throat> for those moments when I have set up a framework of something that I've practiced or rehearsed or performed dozens of times, and I perform it, and then a twist happens, an anomaly happens that I can't explain. Because that keeps my interest going. That's why I've been doing seance work for so long. Because with seance work, it's such an emotionally charged experience for people that I won't say stuff happens, but what you're doing is you're opening this door in people's imaginations. And sometimes stuff happens, you know, that normally in the day-to-day -day existence, they may happen a coincidence once in a couple weeks or months. But there's like this rarefied atmosphere. So one of those incidents happened today, and, and it just blew everybody away, including me. So what happened? So you've built this up now. Let me know. Can you tell us? Yeah. Okay, so I ha I'll have to reveal a sort of a oh. mentalist secret. Oh, well. <clears throat> well, I don't care. Can you just tell me? We'll set the scene up. So what were you, what were you doing? Okay, for so, so the scene was, so you okay, had the, kids. Well, the, the idea was Susan was going to talk about cold reading and hot reading okay. and the difference between the two. And I was going to open up for her talking about how cold or how hot reading can be so effective if it's worked into a mentalist act. In other words, if I'm doing a mentalist routine thing and suddenly I say I'm getting this flash and I say to that person, you are thinking of a, of a number, aren't you? You've been thinking about a number all day. And they say, yes. Okay, and then I say, as a matter of fact, we're near Vegas. It's a playing card, isn't it? And they say, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> trying to figure out how to get around without giving away a secret. Well, you we'll talk what? about hot reading just briefly so people know. Hot reading. Hot read is when you have information beforehand. And you can look these kids up on Facebook and get... You well, know. no, we didn't have time to do that. This is something that is done right before the show. Oh, I see. Okay. Look, I'm just going to say it because there's no way around it. And I don't care because Penn and Teller do the same thing all the time. Okay. You know? And I'm not, I am not afraid of magicians, okay? Okay. <laughs> so what I did is Making I... Making me nervous. <laughs> it might make you famous, so okay. just relax, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get there. There's a classroom of kids, and they're all anxious. And I find one kid, he looks very intelligent. I say, this looks like the right kid for this. Would you mind helping with something that I'm going to do during, during the demonstration? He says, sure. So I say, well, come out, come out in the hall for, with me for a second. So I say, uh, here's a pack of cards. Look at him. He looks at him. And I'm checking him out. And I'm making sure he looks normal. And he's not going to mess with me or anything. And I'm, it's OK. He's OK. I say, all right, mix them any way you want, and then here, just I'm going to run them from hand to hand, touch the back of any one. He touches the back. I cut the cards. I lift it up, and I show it to him. I say, you need to remember this card. And what I did is I forced the four of diamonds onto him. Even though he had mixed the cards, I used sleight of hand to make it look like he had a choice of any card, but I forced the four of diamonds Ooh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's common card knowledge. Force. It's right. card, card force. force is common knowledge. So I take the cards, I put them back in the box. I say, okay, when I call on you, I'm going to ask you some questions. You just have to answer honestly. He says, okay, no problem. So he goes back to his seat. So I do the, the whole thing, and finally I'm just wandering through the audience doing cold reading, and people are just, I'm blowing them away because they're just kids, you know. I'm just doing Barnum lines, and they're just, 
how did you know that? And then I go, well, Give us a Barnum line so people know. Oh, like I said, uh, you like to travel, don't you? Yeah, but you don't get to travel as much as you would like to. And they go, that's true. You know, I know a million of yeah, them. Yeah. You just have to pick the right person. It looks like they're going to agree with you. And then I go, but you guys, I can tell you want something more specific. So now I go over to this guy and I go, what's your name? And he stands up and I shake hands and I say, and we never met before today, right? Which is a great line, right? <laughs> it's true. And oh, and that he, is true, right. Yeah. See, the, these are the verbal things I love. We never met before today. Ten minutes ago we met, but, you know, so, and you're welcome to use that, all you are paying close attention it's old as the hills. Yeah. So he stands up and I say, you have been thinking about a number, haven't you? And he says, well, yeah. And I said, in fact, we're in Las Vegas. Would it be a playing card? And he says, yeah. And I say, I am seeing a red card. And he says, no. Oh. And I'm like, you're not seeing a red card? He says, no. <sighs> and I'm like, uh-oh. Is, is it a diamond? And he says, no, it's that other symbol, that other symbol. And he's getting really confused. And I'm like, it's not a heart because a heart is red and the other two are black. He says, it's black. And I'm like, oh, shit, what has happened here, you know? And I'm looking over at the teacher and the teacher's like looking at us like, you're in the middle of it now. So I said, so it's a black card. And he says, yes. And I said, are you sure? And he says, yes. So I say, what is the card you're thinking of? And he says, I see the five of spades. Okay? So now I'm like, normally I would be sunk. There's no way out of that. Okay? But I just happen to have in my wallet one card that I carry around that is my lucky card. Uh, if I can get it out of my pocket, I'll show you. I, 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 I bring it with me everywhere I go. And I t say that it's from my grandfather, and it was a lucky card. It's really old and really falling apart, but I carry it because it's very magical. And I turn it over, and it's the five of spades. Show, hold that up. And everybody in the room is like, what? OK, so what appears to be, to the rest of the audience, just a, a casual mental <laughs> magic trick. To me, this card basically saved my ass. Yeah. Totally out of the blue. So that's why I'm saying totally unplanned, totally had to dance with the song when it happened, but it was there. Now, then after the thing was over, we went to the teacher. The teacher's going, well, how are they? He said, I was worried about you because that, that child is mentally challenged. He doesn't know red from black or numbers at all. So I had picked somebody who had no idea about playing cards, and yet he chose a five of spades, which happened to be the one card in my wallet. Okay. So now we say to ourselves, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. <laughs> that's why I do this, because otherwise it would have been a total disaster. There wouldn't have been any way for me to get out of it. So <clears throat> these things do not always happen, but when they do, it makes it worth being able to, uh, Bob Cassidy, one of my teachers, used to call it jazz magic. That means you can just go with the flow of what's happening. Wow. So how do I explain that? It's one out of 52, but still, why and how and at that very moment in time? I guess it's, it's more than one out of 52 if the person doesn't know what numbers are or cards. Or has any <laughs> relation to what it is. So. I'm only telling the story to advance the theory that things happen that we can't explain. I can't explain that. I don't think that the child can explain it. The teacher can't explain it. Who's going to explain it? Somebody who's a statistician could probably explain it. But, but then anyway. it's still, all right, that is kind of interesting. I told the teacher, so you, you just saw real magic today. You saw real magic happen with that child. But is that where maybe some of the criticism comes from? Because I, I get confused. Too bad. OK, so I get confused. What criticism about what? I, that you're implying that it's, uh, well, I guess I don't actually know. I am know not what, implying. It happened. It happened. But what is, I guess you've used the words 
I guess also definitions definitions are important here. And I'm I'm a little confused, generally speaking, to most people because everybody defines something the way they think. Right. Of it. So you've used magic a lot today, and to me, magic. What does magic mean to a magician? Does that mean it's an is illusion magic? Because when I go to, to see me a magic means show, turning superstition into coin. Okay. That's what magic means. Okay, so so magic is a giant umbrella. Yeah. Okay, but then underneath magic come all the subheadings of mentalism, um, escapology, sleight of hand, sleight of hand, it's, gambling tricks, all that stuff, and everything. Okay, so magic is just a big umbrella. Right. Okay, so that helps me out a little bit. So. So, I don't know why that that helps me because for some reason it's probably from being a kid. I always thought magic meant it was magic. It was. I don't know what that means. You define not, it now. Okay, I'll define it. As a kid, I didn't realize there was any trickery involved. Oh, okay. You know, I didn't know there was. I thought you know. So, I, if looking through it as an eyes of a four or five year old, if somebody does a sleight of hand trick, even if it's poorly done, yeah, like forcing. Um, the four of diamonds. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, that would be, I, I wouldn't know the setup. You could even have a, a lying, bald faced, lying stooge in the audience. Right. And it would still oh, appear. I love that. Okay. I have no problem with that. Okay. <laughs> but, but as a four year old kid, I'm going, oh my gosh, it's, he's got a 27 cents or however you would say. Yeah. It. So to me, that's what magic meant as a kid. As right. I grew older, then magic, I never thought of anything as magic, it was always a trick. Right. So I would never say anything was magic because right. to me magic meant it wasn't a trick. Somehow this person was accessing some kind of uh, physical reality that most people don't have access to. to but they are. They are accessing a physical reality most people don't have access to by their subterfuge and their misdirection. Okay. Okay. So it, and it's science, and that's what and it's we normal. went into the cast uh, the classroom today, and we said this is science. Everything I'm going to show you, and I did a couple other things I said, is pure science. It's just being manipulated in a different form that maybe you're not used to seeing. But I guarantee that this is how we investigate things. This is how science works through experimentation. If a trick doesn't work right, you have to take the corners off and round it and, make, and smooth everything out. So it is science. But some science we don't understand. And it's like skeptics are like... Most science. <laughs> I know, that's what I mean. Skeptics are like, no, we're going to draw a box around it. Well, you know what? I'm not worried about that. I'm more interested in people, you know, understanding how easy they can not only fool other people, but they can fool themselves. Well, I should say that even though I understand things are a trick, it's so impressive to me. I, I, I love the show. I, love right? the, I don't care that I don't understand it. In fact, that makes it worthwhile. Like, I know it's a trick, but I could never, I could never show you what you're doing. I don't right. know. I'm not going to lie to you right. and myself and say, oh, it's just a trick, so I'm not impressed. Right. I've, I love sleight of hand. He, Card tricks. I saw uh, this fellow, Paul Gertner, with the cups and balls. Oh, yeah, I know. I love the cups and balls because yeah. it's yeah. so... You guys, you practice for years to be that's so right. deft. It's not unlike being great at... But see, that's a routine. That is something that he does practice for years. And you don't practice pulling off the pulling off. You don't practice cold reading and the, the knowledge and the psychology. Not anymore. No, I but mean, you did. I, did, I do it in real life because real life throws these curves at you that you have to learn to deal with. And that's one of my objections to most magic is it's pretty to look at. But after a while, you watch somebody who's been doing the same act for 40 years, and they're not, they're not in the in the zone you know about the zone with yeah, yeah. jazz they're not they're not engaging the spectator anymore they're just going through the motions right. and to me that and that is why okay i'm going to throw this out i know it sounds crazy but that's why i'm here it's like <laughs> what if okay this is i'm just positing this what if by opening a door in someone's mind like this kid today and this is why skeptics don't like me. What if, and I know, I know that I don't know what the odds are, but what if by opening the door in this kid's mind, he saw the five of spades? <laughs> okay. I mean, most people would say, I want to believe that something like that can happen. Yes. Okay. So, and I'm not, I'm not immune to that either. So there is a part of me, even though I'm a died in the wool skeptic and a magician and I take things apart every day, maybe I want to believe still. So if I, 
it, it used to be called in the 60s, it was called a psi-conducive state. That means you somehow the trap door opens and something squeaks through. Now, I know that's fictional and it sounds silly, but I'm just bringing that out to you as a rationalist to say, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. When you say that skeptics hate you, let's tone that down a little bit because you've got some really... Some. Okay, there you go. Because you've got some really hard-hitting skeptics that appreciate... That's true. ...to no end the work that you do. Yeah, no, and I'm, I mean, not, I'm so not trying to trying to discount that. I'm just, it only takes a few and skeptic naysayers. skeptic is a huge, is a huge word, yeah, like it only magic. Takes, I mean. It takes a few naysayers that have a big mouth to really make life difficult, you know? When you say maybe you want to believe... Or what if. Or what if. That's a line that you hear from a lot of people if you start to point things out ra rationally. They don't even have to be super believers, but you know, um, some of my siblings who are religious, for yeah, instance. If yeah. you get into a religious discussion, sometimes they will fall back into just, well, I don't want to live in a world where that's not true. Right. But that doesn't actually affect the way the world is. No. Just because that you don't want to live in a world where the good don't get rewarded and the bad go to hell, so to right. speak. Right. That doesn't actually affect anything no. at all. Except, so saying, and neither does the five of spades, for that matter. So that's a very adult thing to just fall back on, I don't want to not live in a world where I can't believe in magic. Well, but see, I'm, I think I'm past that one. Okay. I'm, I'm like, I don't believe in it. I'm just curious about how these anomalies seem to occur. And they seem to occur, they're unplanned, they're, are, they're, they're always surprising. They always seem to appear or happen uh, at an advantageous point, or so it seems. So, I mean, I don't know how to explain it other than to say coincidence. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, coincidence is, you know, science's way of describing what we can't really give an answer to, really. You know, so, and I'm happy with that. But when I did seances, a lot of these things happened, and it really made me wonder, okay? I, was, I wasn't hoping, I was just wondering how the hell did this happen? I would be in a situation that would be so compelling that I had to like sit down and, and kind of back engineer what had occurred until, until I could use my skepticism to say, well, that's what happened. I've never been to one of your seances, seances but I've read about them mm -hmm. just from your own descriptions. And, but what I've read from seances years and years and years ago done in the dark and table tipping and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You're not doing that where you lift the table. No. Right, so that's, that's total trickery and you know, you yeah, turn the lights on and you can see the... Yeah, it's... it's so not, maybe define what a, a modern... It's not a modern seance, no. whatever that means. I, I, do a, I do a re imagining of a traditional Victorian seance. But I don't do the table tilting and I don't do, it depends, again, it depends on what the budget is. You don't is. see a ghost appear on the wall or an apparition, I should say? No, because I've chase... learned if the story is strong enough, they will see those things in their minds anyway. Oh, that is a powerful statement. It's true, because suggestion plays a lot to do with what you do. Because I do it in two, two parts. The first is called the light seance. <clears throat> that is full of different suggestions and different experiments to coax people along so that they're kind of on the edge. And then the dark seance is when all the lights are out and then you pull all the stops and you freak people out and while they're in that. So you're kind of warming them up first. Yeah, you can't just walk into a room and go, here's the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I don't know. You, no, you can, unless it's the tiki room at Disneyland, you can do that. But that's not the way a good storyteller does it. It's a ladder, and each step of the ladder takes them a little further away from reality. Like the first thing you do is something that maybe they heard about and they, they believe it's possible, like a memory thing or something. Then the second thing is a little more way out, like telepathy, and then the next step. See what I mean? Yeah. So what you're doing is you're, you're drawing them in and coaxing them in to the final thing, which is that they're going to they're gonna experience something really wild. And they do. And I've, I had to learn many years ago that if people applaud at the end of my seance, then I haven't done a good job.
It's like thank you very much for coming. If they applaud, yeah, it's like ma it's like a magic show. You did a nice magic show. Thank you. I want people to just be with their mouths hanging open and just freaked out. All right, let's talk skepticism now. Okay. Serious skepticism. Serious. Here's a quote, I guess, from you. So what made me turn around was that I saw how easy it was to manipulate and control. And my question then is, turn around from what? Did you actually get such positive feedback from people you were starting to believe more than not that you were really psychic? And really no, pulling what off I was these... starting to see is that I was making really great money and people liked me and that if I wanted to, and I got a lot of testimonial letters where people were like, you are a God man, you know, yeah. bless you for your skills and, you know, it turns your head a little bit. Okay. So and it it's in the book. Head. It started to turn my head a little bit and I started to say, you know, maybe I do. Just like I just said, what if? It's like back then it was like, maybe, I don't know, maybe I should just go with this. I'm doing okay. People seem to like me. But then I was like, no, no, no. What is wrong with you? You know, I had to like kick myself. And I, what I would do is I would, I would watch the movie Nightmare Alley. Uh-huh. Yeah, you talked about that. <laughs> and I finally watched it. Yeah. And every time I watch it, I see somebody go that route where they are greedy and they decide they're going to go for the big money and that's what happens. So I just, you know, I just uh, took that as a, as a, a prophetic uh, story and uh, pulled myself out of my own ego. But sometimes it was pretty challenging. So for you, the praise just... Um it didn't make you think that you were pulling this off by supernatural means. You, no. It was just, you're such, you know, it was a big ego boost for you. Yeah. And I was scam, I was getting away with scamming the people who were saying they had the best psychics in the world. And I was able to hang out with those people and have interactions with them where I learned about what they were doing and how they were doing it. And it was fascinating. So that's fascinating to me because I would think that the criticism or the blowback would have come from those people, not the... They don't care. They don't care because they'll go on making, making their money the same way. Well, that's the interesting thing. Even though you blow you know, the whistleblower, so to speak, yeah, it yeah. Doesn't, nobody's, you know... Eh. And that's what's frustrating about it is because for every it's whack a mole every, for every one psychic that, we, that we've done a sting on or taken down, three more come up. Well, let's talk, let's talk about that part of the skepticism first. So how did, so you're formally involved with skepticism, I'll say. So you, you were, <laughs> what I mean by that is you were part of when Psych, uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry was Committee for Investigation into the Claims of the Paranormal. Right. Committee for Psychop. Psychop, Committee for Skeptical Investigation. You, before, I mean, you were a performance artist, magic, mentalism, all that. Mm -hmm. Where does Psychop come in? You, you, Psychot comes in because when I was... Or how uh, did you get involved with it? I mean, how do, you, do all mentalists kind of always, like jazz musicians, after the gig they talk about music? Do all no. mentalists and magic people go out and hang out and talk about no. skepticism? So how do you get involved with an organization of skeptics? Well, what happened with me is around 1972, when I was first auditioning and working at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, uh, that was the same time that Uri Geller was starting to be talked about. And uh, I had also gone to art school, and I had a, a humanities teacher who had witnessed a Geller bend all the, he said, all the silverware on the table at the dinner that he was at. And these were scientists. These were people who were not, it wasn't done as a magic show. And so I had heard first-person recollections from people who had seen this guy bend metal with his mind. So it was completely unheard of. And it was kind of a sea change in magic because silverware will never be the same after that 10-year period. So I was fascinated with that. And I said, here is somebody taking this idea of psychic powers and making it physical and bringing it forward to an audi a new audience, you know, scientists, not just kids and birthday parties. So I said, you know what? And the, 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 I started reading, and I went to a couple seminars with Russell Targ and these people from... Uh, and from he was a parapsychologist? So, yeah. So a PhD-trained person that was looking for the evidence. Yeah, and they believed Geller was real at that point. 
Oh yeah. Foolhard. No, I understand that. I'm yeah. just wondering if they started with belief or they started with skepticism, but we can go past. They started with skepticism, but the problem is that Geller snookered them and right. he he's such a great performer that he just blew them away. So they started spreading this word and it got stronger and stronger and I said, "You know what?" And and then I heard about uh, skeptics groups and I said, I reasoned to myself, and here's the crux of your answer, was that if somebody was going to find something real or some sort of anomalous power that somebody could hold in their hands, that that it was going to come from scientists, it wasn't going to come from believers because they already believe in all that because we had the new age thing and so I said, I'm going to hook up with these skeptics and see who I can find. And then I started meeting Ray Hyman, and I met Jerry Andrus. So you went to a psychop meeting, or you started no, subscribing I, I went, to the No, the first one was called the California Skeptics, and that was Al Seckel, who turned out to be a total, total charlatan himself. Oh, I didn't. And then I went from that to uh, Michael Shermer and Skeptic Magazine. I okay. worked with them. And then I... I wanted to do real investigation, so that's how I got involved with CFI. So I've always had this thing, you know, what if? And the only way you can really explore that is to be around people who actually do testing. And the, the sad truth is that my magic skills, even though I offered them, you know, to watch for sleight of hand and see if somebody was doing a switch, it's like Banachek or anybody else, Nothing ever happened. They all believed that they could do these things. So now I'm kind of lukewarm about all that. Wait a minute. So go back to that. They all believe. You're, I'm unlike- saying most of the applicants that we had for, like, uh, CFI had a $100,000 yeah. challenge, and Randy had the million-dollar challenge. And you were pretty. You were heavily involved with the $100,000 one, right? Oh, yeah. You organized some of those. So. Oh, I did, like, six years of that. Okay. But it turned out that every single one of those incidents were people who were highly deluded. Some of them were actually mentally ill and really believed they had this ability. But when we tested it, it never happened. Right. But I assume that they're not... I assume everybody for JREF or the PSYCOP challenge, they believe they could do it. Yeah. And not they don't have to be deluded. They just believe, like, the remote viewing or whatever their so-called power is, you know, given, right. given the 13. But that doesn't mean... That just means they've... I, I believe they believe it because that's the feedback they've gotten. But under proper controlled circumstances, it's pointed out that they falls don't believe apart. Right, it. Right, completely falls apart. So It's kind of sad, really. So why is it because you're taking something away from their... I don't understand why it's sad. Unless they actually are really mentally... It's sad really because Ill. it's a waste of time. Oh, okay. Because some of the protocol that we designed took up to two years to... to, to, to get the And I mean, to... it was airtight. But that's important. It is important. I learned how to do it, and I understand it. So I'm not saying those years were wasted. What I'm saying is it's kind of like, I don't want to say that what I'm really thinking, but the, the point is at a certain point after the sixth or seventh person who you see them crestfallen, they're like, gee, it didn't work? I, I was sure it was going to work. One guy, he got in the car. I picked him up from the airport. He says, do you have the check? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't have the check. I said, you have to pass a test. First you do the preliminary, then you do the final test, then you get the check. Well, I'm going to need that money to get back home. I mean, he was oh. so sure that he was going to breeze through the test that he was, like, shaking me down for the check. That and, is kind of sad. Yeah, because he had spent his last money on the plane ticket to get to L.A., and then he did it. And he that. thought he was like a breakthrough in oh, humanity. Oh, he thought he was it. Or he or she, or whoever it is. Yeah, I guess it they all a, think all we that. Did is a, we did a very simple um, bent twig and water. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out. What For is the that? dowsing. Dowsing. And it was all controlled, and he had to get five right, didn't get any right. Yeah. And he was like, how am I going to get home? You know, and we're like. I understand that part of it, but I assume. I didn't actually think that anybody that came to the JREF was actually trying to scam you. I figured they all knew because they yeah, scamming but you. Should, you should have seen some of the things that went on, you know, backstage for some of those to well, make sure they weren't scamming them. Because remember, Randy's a magician. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had to have people around him who would make sure everything, because it was a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, when they did the Connie Sohn, they had like... 
two like Brinks truck drivers standing on the stage. It was like one of Houdini's shows or something, you know. They have the million dollar check in their hand, you know. And, and if anybody wants to check these out, there are several available on YouTube. You yeah. can just Google and yeah. and actually some they talk about the protocol, you get to see ten or eleven. It's not the it most exciting all, two hours. It's all legit. Yeah. It is legit. But at a certain And that's point, how you became involved was organizing those tests. That that was a big part of what you did then. I, yeah, I did. I organized them, and I set up other things that never got done. And that's why Susan and I finally said, you know what? We're just going to start doing this stuff on our own. So I guess my thing also is it'd be interesting if somebody w were real and could prove it, and, you, and they, they, like, they, they shook the it quantum. It change the entire change world the overnight. But it's been so long, and the, no, nobody passes a protocol. It almost is like, why are you still telling? It's just like. They're not. I got. I know they're not now, but they were until very recently. Correct? Right. No, they're not doing. They're so it's not, not even really... worth the trouble. So now, I don't know if it's worth the trouble or not because there's always a new generation of people coming into skepticism who get excited by this idea. So I'm not poo-pooing the whole thing. Yeah. I'm saying that it's an important fact to understand how to create a protocol to test somebody. I mean, I've had people come to my home. Who, I pers who came to me with something that was so fantastic and they just seemed like a normal guy, like a guy you'd see in line at the bank and he'd say, will you, will you test this because I can't figure out why this is happening. They come to my home and I test it and it didn't work. And you explain why? Or <laughs> but all I can explain is that something happened to this man where he really believed it. So I don't know what could have happened. He could have had a breakdown. He could have... A stroke? I don't know. But he was firmly convinced and so convinced that I said, okay, I'm willing to take the time to do this. And I did it and it didn't work. All right. So now let's talk about what Mark does now. Because okay. you mentioned Su Susan. Yes. And so unlike the protocols and all that stuff, now you're choosing to do these stings. Yes. Confronting. Um, conf and, and it's called guerrilla skepticism. It's a term that I kind of generated. And even before this, I mean, I've seen this clip, <laughs> this clip of you where not so much a sting as you went to um, like a Sylvia Brown show. And yeah, you, you, I punked her. Somehow you got to the mic and like passed whole, out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that isn't, isn't even a sting really. It's just to like throw her off her game or something or see how she Well, can... no, what it is is Susan So that's and performance I... art, by the way, right? You go yes, there. it is. And I love that kind of street stuff. I, I've always loved that. That's, that's where my roots are. I, I'm not afraid of, of uh, you know, I'd like to, I like to take things right to the edge where it becomes... Just possibly litigious, but not quite. Yeah, 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 I can see how that would have so, been. So, uh, but Susan and I have realized over the years of looking at all these psychics that we no longer care about what the audience thinks. Because we did a couple things a long time ago where we had people and or we saw other people stand up and say, you're a fraud, and they were thrown out of the building. I was thrown out of a show, you know, at the Biltmore Hotel. Found myself sitting out on the curb, and it was like, because you stood up and yelled out? No, it's because I did some other, I put some uh, cold reading notes on everybody's chair. Oh. And they saw me doing it. Oh, and they, okay. it was Chip Coffee, and he had these big thug guys watching everybody. So we realized we're not playing to the, to the audience anymore. They bought their ticket. They bought into it. They're believers. Most of them are bereaved. They're really hurting. Why add to their pain, you know? But. If we can get to the psychic, if we can pull the rug out from underneath that person or show them that in the audience they might be deal dealing with some people who can turn things around on them, then it, then it becomes a whole different game. So we've designed these stings where we do it, we, we set it all up, and then we pull it off. And then the challenge now is to find media big enough who's willing to take the story on and pass it on. Because we are not interested in preaching to the choir anymore. It's just we're here, right? But yeah. we're, we're, uh, we're doing that as a favor. We're, what we're really interested in is getting, getting like we did with the New York Times. The sting we did was taken up by the New York Times. And, you and might, that, you know, let's give us the full headline so people can check and search that out. And I'll try and put basically a link. Basically, it was, it was called... Um, how uh, psychic investigators uh, uh, catch celebrity psychics. So if anybody just looks that up on the internet, yeah, your name, look it'll up come up. Susan Gerbic, uh, look up uh, New York Times psychic article. 
So it was a very complicated protocol. I don't really want to go into no, it because you can see it all on online. But the bottom line is that uh, we caught this guy red-handed using Facebook information in a show. And we double-blinded it because we went to the show, but we were only given certain information. In other words, I was going because I was worried about my, my father had a bad heart. I was worried about my heart. Should I go to the doctor? Susan's story was that she had a, a brother who died of pancreatic cancer. She doesn't have. Okay, so we each had these backstories, but we also had closed down and locked Facebook pages that had been groomed for months where we're talking about all this. And every once in a while, we, uh, we're, we're saying, I'm so excited, I'm going to go and see Thomas John, that's the name of the psychic. And uh, we can't wait till the show, hope he gets in touch with Andrew, my brother, you know. And So we threw the bait out, and guess what? He took it verbatim so we have the screenshots from facebook and then we have the audio of him <laughs> and it matches up just perfectly so then we waited see we didn't stand up and say we're gonna get you we played it and we stayed in character and then we waited until we found the right reporter he wanted to do this then he wrote the story and then it went out to you know 500 million people it was in the drudge report it was in an English magazine, it was all over the place. So now, what do we do? It's like the science march, we did that, so what? What do you do with that? So now all these TV shows are coming out of the wall, you know, <laughs> coming out of the cracks in the walls, trying to get us to do a reality show. Oh, really? Yeah, and we've already signed a couple things, but we've told them, you know, we don't want the money, we don't want the notoriety, and what we really don't want and we refuse to do, so anybody who's listening, please pay attention. If you think we're going to do a story that shows both sides of the mediumship right. thing, we're not interested because we don't like that when they say, well, maybe, what if spirits are real, you know? Bullshit. This is going to be down and dirty like bullshit was, only not quite as harsh. It is kind of disappointing because you do see those kind of shows on respect so-called respected networks. Yeah, news, morning news shows. Well, no, but what I mean, it's also like on <laughs> Discovery or Bravo or the National... History th Channel. They're trying, you know, you think, oh, this is going to be an interesting report on how it's right. happened over, it's going to be a history of psychic, and then it turns out that the, it comes out, is it real or is it fake? Yeah. Well, and no, then they go into this whole thing and they end up going, well, we, gosh, really a lot of strange things happen, Bob, we so are, I don't know, it might we be... We are going for the jugular. We would rather have a show like one of these crime drama shows that really shows how nasty these mediums are and oh, the yeah. things that they will do. And there's no shortage of material for that. That is true. So anybody who's out there, we're waiting. But the key, and this is the most important part of this whole thing I'm going through, is that we need backing. We need backing of big media, like 2020 or some kind of show, because all these shows want to give us like, well, we'll give you three and a half minutes. No. We, we, want, we want to do a series or some kind of something that can really describe the protocol and show people how this is done. And they're just not interested in the truth on that level. That's because it's not about the truth on that level. That's right. It's about ratings and selling advertising. And that so is true. They want you to get to the end of that segment and say, and they'll go back to the host, you know, Larry or whoever, they'll go back, they'll show your bit, they'll cut back to the studio guys, and they'll go, oh, I don't know, Mark and Susan, you know, they didn't find it, but, you know, my sister sees things. I've still got an open mind about it. Then because, we wouldn't go on that show. But you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They, the always, the they want it to end that no way. No one will give you what is called uh, production rights because we're nobody. So, so, but we're well, still... Well, even if you, they still don't want it, they still want it to end up with a question mark. Not but, everybody. Okay. There's somebody actually here at the conference. There was somebody here last year. There's somebody here this year. There'll be somebody here next year who's like a talent scout who's been pumping me for information, right? He wants to do a he wants to do one of these kind of reality shows. But the thing is that the reality shows are not reality right. shows. Yeah. And it, it's non-scripted. So how are you going to really you know, but I will talk to him and I will I will tell him what I think. But I'm, uh, that's the next step because if you get if you get the right media, 
then it will then you'll see a lot of I mean we see Susan gets emails and letters every week from people who are like I can't believe that this is how this guy did this because one of the things we hear everywhere we go is there's no way in the world the psychic could know that. So the, so you do, so uh, that's what I want to ask. So you're getting positive feedback from people that see this and go you've opened my eyes. Yeah. Good. They're like they're like I can't believe that I fell for this. So they're grateful. Oh, good. They're grateful. Well, they're not only grateful, but they go back and look at their Facebook pages and they see where the psychic got the information from. So TJ, yeah. like every other psychic that's been busted, even through JREF. Now you say that they were some of the people that did the protocol studies that came up empty-handed, they were devastated. But you know, they turn around and say, "Well, they were unfair. They treated me." Yeah, unfairly. right. So they somehow they rationalize it, and so yeah. TJ just came right out and said, "Well, I never looked at anybody's Facebook page. That's right. I never." So is there any doubt in your mind that either TJ or someone in the organization? I mean, you're not going to buy that, right? Somebody had the organi to, what organization? I don't know. I don't know if he has an organ. You know how some. What do they call it? People that do the pre-show. No, he can't say anything else. What is he going to say? That we're right? He's bust. Well, I mean, it kind of seems... He's busted. I guess busted. you're right. You take it right to the end. Yeah, he you, is busted, and he can't get out of deny, it. Deny, deny, deny. And he is pissed off because he goes after Susan all the time. You know, but why that, is he focusing that woman, on her? Look at her eyes. She's crazy, you know? Well, oh, why is he <laughs> focusing on her, I wonder, not you? Because she got under his skin, and she's not letting go. She keeps following each thing. Yeah, each time she, each time, each time he puts up a video, oh. and it's and it's some kind of thing where he says this reading shows that we use controls, and then Susan just takes it apart and says there is no control here. Here's the Facebook listing that from this person. She she knows how to investigate it, so he can't get he's he can't get a foothold anymore unless you're already a believer. And we just had a gentleman who was such a believer that he said there's no way that he could have known this, and then he lied to us and told us that he didn't buy the tickets, his name wasn't on a list, there's no way he could have looked okay. his name up, and it turned out she found where on his Facebook page he said, I bought tickets to the show. So he wanted to believe so much that he lied to Susan to throw her off. Didn't throw her off. See? So. Wow. It's a it's a tough thing to even want to do. I mean, you you show people and then they just. But you are getting you are getting feedback that you've opened my eyes, and so you oh, know absolutely. it's working. Yeah, and that's why I think a television show would work too. It's just how you feed it to the audience. So speaking of all that, so here we are. Where are you going now? You've done yeah. you've done several of these things. Yeah, you're looking for the reality or. Ah, I'm glad you asked. Oh, because now <laughs> we have. The mother of all stings. It's been stung or it's about to be? It's, it's planned. Everybody is in place. Everybody's in the trenches. Everybody has been uh, upgraded in all the necessary protocol. But we're not going to do it until we get media coverage. And I mean not inside edition and not these, you know, Hollywood <laughs> entertainment shows. We want somebody who's going to be putting it on big time. And we're not going to We told people, if you want this, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost $12,000 to do what we have planned. And that's cheap production cost, actually. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we, people have offered us half that, but they want us to pay the other half. No chance, because, and, and Susan says this, and I will agree with her, once this final sting is done. Mediumship as we know it today will be over. Well, and when I said that's cheap production cost, that's cheap money for a big yeah. network show. That's nothing. But it, ha but it has to be done with production people who know what they're doing, not just somebody who wants to do a come to my house with a camera and do a day oh, shoot. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, got, it's, a, it's a very complicated maneuver. And we thought of it as a joke. We said, what if we did this? And then we went, yeah, that's, it. that's what we need to do. So. And there's been some bites and some nibbles, but the problem is these shows, even if they're brand new, they want control, you know? Like Inside Edition, well, we want, we want uh, Lisa Guerrero to be the one to do the investigation. Yeah, she's, she's just a model who's on their show. She doesn't have any idea about psychic protocol or anything like that. 
So but you can read a teleprompter. That's what I mean. And that's what they <laughs> did with one of the shows I did with them, and I was very upset about it because that's a long story. But okay. it's like, I don't, I don't need to prop up one of your people. You've got a whole thing here. What's wrong with you? You know, this is, you've read about it. You know about it. Let's do this. All right. That's where we're at. Well, let's see what happens. I know. And hopefully in the next, I think by summertime, we'll have settled this down to something. Because Summer that, of 2020. Yeah, because that's when the, Susan signed a uh, Don't contract. reveal too much that you... Discussed. No, I won't. All they did, all she did was say, okay, I won't, I won't do this with anybody else until I, I hear back from you. something like that. Yeah, an option. Oh, how <laughs> exciting. It Stand is, by, everybody. It is very exciting because, again, the, the bottom kind of falls out of the seance room when this is done. <laughs> and, and, I mean, you know, it's all we can do. It's all, it's, it's, we can't do much more than that. And if people still want to believe, which they will, uh, just watch for Operation Lima Beans. All right, Mark Edward. Mark Edward. Psychic thank you for super... having me. Oh, you're A welcome. I, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I did. I hope you got to ask some of the questions you wanted to ask. I did get, I got to ask most of all of them. Very uh, good. 502 Conversations. I am Brian Kirby. This has been Mark Edward. Actually, you still are Mark Edward. It, has... it hasn't changed. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.